Hello, my name is Peter Head. I'm a consultant to the large global consultancy, Arup, but now I'm actually an executive chairman of a new charity that I've set up called the Ecological Sequestration Trust, and I'll tell you a bit more about that uh, a bit later on. But why am I talking to you today? It's basically because over the last six years, I've been managing and running the planning business of Arup globally. Uh, I'm an engineer, and actually I've delivered major infrastructure projects around the world, so I know about infrastructure. But I realize the infrastructure we're building doesn't necessarily enable us to live sustainably on the planet anymore. So I thought if I moved into planning, I might be able to see how we could change some of those things. And we were very fortunate about five and a half years ago to be able to be engaged in planning of eco-cities in China. And the reason that happened was the Chinese government realized that their economic development model was beginning to be a problem because they were using so much resources to actually develop these new cities that they were running into problems of finding enough resources, running into problems of pollution, and therefore were looking for a new model of development to use less resources, more renewable resources, and reduce pollution. So we were given the opportunity to try that out. All the things that I learned in that process with my team then led to me doing a global lecture tour where I was able to study and report to 30 countries on how they could move to what I call the ecological age in which we actually stop using non-renewable resources wastefully, stuff we dig out of the ground, process through our cities and then create waste that pollutes the air, the soil and the water. So moving from that model, which I call the industrial model of development, to one where we use renewable resources efficiently. So we close loops. We actually use resources and recycle materials using renewable energy if possible. And in that way, we can grow the use of renewable resources as much as we like because they're renewable and we reduce pollution. So that transition is one that I call going from the industrial to the ecological age. And when I went to 30 countries and discussed that with countries who are at different stages of development, I got a very, very strong and interested response. And I convinced myself that many countries actually believe that that's the direction we have to go in. Now, just looking at global metrics for a minute, if we look at China, China is actually growing its economy by building cities. And in order to do that, it requires extra resources every year for that. And the me metric that tells you how much resources they're using is called ecological footprint. And the ecological footprint in China is growing at 4% a year. That means when you have 1.3 billion people who are each using about 2.3 hectares of land to support their lifestyle today, and that grows by 4% a year, that means you have to find 100 million hectares of new land every year to continue that process going. And that's an area twice the size of France. So China is out there looking for an area twice the size of France, additionally, every year to support urbanization. And clearly it's realizing that can't go on for another 10 to 20 years because there just isn't enough land, there isn't enough agricultural productivity, uh, to actually support it. So China has decided it must move to the ecological civilization, and it's got five drivers to do that in every region in China now. One is still GDP, the old measure of resource consumption. But the second one is, is energy efficiency. That's improving energy efficiency every year. The third one is reducing carbon intensity, which is actually reducing the emissions from consumption in cities. The next one is improving air quality, and the final one is improving water quality. So every region of China is now trying to do all of those things and develop urbanization models that enable that to happen. So China is starting to move in this general direction, and I call that a new paradigm or a new model of urban development that meets objectives of low carbon and closing resource loops and reducing ecological footprint. 
And China, I think, is the only country that's got something called the circular economy law, which encourages manufacturers who produce waste to sell their waste to another company to use it as a resource in another process and so on. So there are incentives in China to move to this, this process. So I've learned a lot from China, but what do we do in the West? In, in the West, we're still living an industrial lifestyle. We have an ecological footprint, which is around three planets worth of resources. And so what do we do? How do we change our lifestyles uh, in order to improve um, all those things and actually move to the ecological age? One of the things I've helped to do is create an, an organization called the Institute for Sustainability in London. And that's been done to try and seed the idea of total community retrofit. And this is the idea that if you take a community that's large enough in one of the UK cities, you can actually help the community to move to this ecological age lifestyle over 10 to 15 years by investing in resource efficiency, in closing loops, in actually living a cheaper life for all of us and our families at the same time as reducing pollution and reducing dependency on the materials that come all over, from all over the world that are getting more and more expensive and more difficult to find. In other words, using renewable resources efficiently and maybe more local resources. In the process of analyzing that, we've realized that you can't just do this at, at a city scale. You have to connect urban development with rural development. And let me illustrate um, a couple of uh, points about that. One is that in cities we produce a lot of biomass waste, uh, sewage waste and also um, waste from our gardens and trees and so on. Now if that waste were put through um, digesters uh, with bacteria in, that waste could be digested and the carbon and compost could then be made available to farmers outside the city and nutrients could be used for growing food and, and, and other things. And the wastewater that comes out of the treatment of water in cities could also be made available to farmers in order to provide a more reliable source of water for agriculture. Now, none of those things are happening at the moment. And if we do that, it's possible to lift food production outside the city and connect it to the purchasing of food inside the city to, to help close those loops. And the other thing, of course, is there's a lot of renewable resources available outside the city in waste from agriculture, um, biomass from forests. And if we put that through these digesters as well, that carbon, instead of being burned or going into the atmosphere, can be recycled into compost and back into food production and farmland as well to improve soil quality. So the model that I talked about earlier in China can start to begin to be retrofitted onto our cities in, in the West. And you may ask, where does the money come from for, for doing that? Um, we reckon, on average, it costs around 10,000 to 20,000 pounds per home to retrofit a whole area of a city. Well, basically, pension funds, who actually have money pouring into their coffers every day, have to invest it in something. And they're very interested in investing in um, aspects which achieve a, a guaranteed return through, um, uh, through savings in resource costs. And therefore it is possible to actually close that loop to create an investment proposition for pension funds to enable this to be done. So basically what we're trying to fashion is, is a large-scale demonstration project where the lifestyle in, in a region uh, could be changed and families can live a much better lifestyle with less cost um, and maybe I, what I should do is just illustrate a few things that could happen uh, in that model. One is cars. Now uh, in the UK on average uh, we drive about 7,500 miles a year in our cars and we spend about 5,000 pounds a year in actually running that car. And that works out, if you, if you work it out, it's about, on average, about an hour every day that we drive a car uh, that we own. So the rest of the time it's sitting in a parking space that we might have to pay for doing nothing. Um, and it probably costs us around £15 an hour to actually um, use the car. If we had a car club 
down the road where you had cars that were available, it might only cost about five pounds an hour to, to drive a car. So if we had car clubs that were available to enable people to, to literally drive whenever they wanted to with a car that's suitable for putting your, your baby in, so it's got a base for your car seat and so on, then actually the costs of driving can go down. The number of cars we need is dramatically reduced and, and it's sort of a thing that everybody wins. So that's one example. And another example is, as I said earlier, is to take the organic waste and digest it in cities and make that waste available for urban food production. It seems to me that communities in the UK at the moment that are suffering because of lack of jobs, uh, because of rising costs, would be well advised to start urban uh, food production using compost and nutrients. If everybody had a little wormery in their house that put their waste food in, then they'd have enough nutrients to, to, to grow food, to, to grow um, geraniums and window boxes to attract the bees and set up community beehives, things like that. So there are many opportunities, but in the end, sort of coming towards the conclusion of this, it's very important that we use ecological systems in the transition to the ecological age. It's not just a technical fix. It's actually working with the natural world to actually enable us to um, move forward. So it's stewardship of the land, it's bringing ecology back, it's using bacteria, it's using algae systems, it's, it's digesting and recycling carbon, managing nitrogen and phosphorus and water and sunlight in a much more intelligent way, which, as I've tried to illustrate, is something we can do in our own homes quite effectively. So I hope that's given you some ideas of the sort of things that we can do um, that in principle I call biomimicry um, and we use Janine Benyus's wonderful work in our technical development of these new ideas. Thank you very much for listening.